Well, welcome everyone. I'm R.T. Ryback from the Minneapolis Foundation, and I want to join you with my co-host, Shonda Smith-Baker from the Minneapolis Foundation. She and I are going to be uh, leading this. We're also, our partner on this is Catherine Gray. Catherine is not only a person who's going to be really good at monitoring the chat box, but she's the person who for, um, for seven years has led a pretty remarkable collection of efforts at the foundation. You'll be hearing more about as Shonda speaks later uh, that have really been about voter engagement uh, and also about uh, using engagement of communities to, uh, to really engage in the census. And the results are in that we've not only had great turnout, but also the highest census response in the state. And that is work that Catherine has led for the Minneapolis Foundation. So uh, we'll be hearing more about that later, but that's our team from the foundation. But what this is, is it's part of what we're trying to do to have the foundation be not just a place to give grants to the community, but to really be about moving the community forward on issues, but also convening them. We see ourselves as not just a foundation, but a community of generosity. And so the idea behind that is that we as people who may be donors, who may be recipients of grants, who may be community partners in some way, who may be members of any part of the public, see us as a place to engage in contemporary issues. So over the next hour, we're going to talk a bit about some of the implications of the issues. We'll give you a little bit of the national flavor, but don't expect this to be the last half hour of uh, your latest cable access show. What we're really gonna do is give you some sense of what the national results mean for us as people who live in this country, as people who live in Minnesota, for those of us in this metropolitan area, and there's some huge changes. But uh, I want to welcome our guest right now and set that up by saying that, um, that we have now set um, an extraordinary collection of records that he'll get into in voter turnout. But throughout all of this election season, when there's been a lot of noise and fervor and loud voices and from all different directions, uh, our Secretary of State has been a rock solid, clear, concise leader on issues of voting and voting access and so many other. So, uh, so I'm hearing, sorry about that echo folks, but with this, I wanna turn it over to the Secretary of State. He's a very busy person. We sure appreciate you joining us. And uh, Steve, I wonder if, or I should say, Mr. Secretary, I wonder if I can ask you to, uh, to give us a top line on what have we seen here in the election. Sure. Steve is fine, please. Uh, I've never been a title snob. Thank you all for having me. I really, really appreciate it. And I'm never too busy to talk to the Minneapolis Foundation because of the great work that you do. And I want to retain, return and repay the compliment. You all, the Minneapolis Foundation and RT Ryback in particular, have been rock stars this election cycle. You really stepped in at a critical juncture. And this is obviously work that you're all passionate about and for good reason. And you've really had a, a, a tremendously positive effect. So you own some of the success that I'm about to talk about. We like to pat ourselves on the back in Minnesota, sometimes to excess, but I hope you'll permit me uh, 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 and indulge me here today to talk about what I think by all measures was a really successful election. And just to zoom out for a minute, let me state what is perhaps obvious, but bears repeating. Um, this was an election like no other. Um, all elections are intense. Presidential elections are particularly intense for all the right uh, reasons. But this year, on top of all that intensity, layered on top of it, was the very real anxiety of a once-in-a-century pandemic. So just from an administrative standpoint, forget the politics for a minute, it was really hard and really challenging. And so uh, a lot of people across the state, Minneapolis Foundation, our partners in city and county governments who do the frontline electioneering, electioneering, they really deserve a lot of the support and congratulations as well. We knew early on, like March, April, the dawn of the COVID era, that this was gonna be different just from an administrative standpoint, that it would have downstream effects on our democracy, that just as COVID was affecting our health and our lives and our jobs and our schools, it would also affect our democracy. So very early on, we made the pivot and leaned hard into the message that people should strongly consider other ways of voting this year from a public health standpoint. All ways of legally voting are equally worthy. That wasn't the point. The point was that among the equally worthy voting, people should take a good hard look at voting either early in person or voting from home. 
And boy, did Minnesotans step up. The number as of just before this call of accepted absentee ballots, that is either those sent in the mail, those dropped off in person, or those cast in person, was north of 1.9 million. And to put that number in perspective for you, um, that is uh, more than triple what it had ever been in Minnesota. And we now have about 3.2 million votes uh, in Minnesota. So as a percentage, that was more than half of the voters. More than half the voters, uh, by a long shot, uh, voted not in the polling place on election day, but outside of that space. And that was a win-win. That's a win-win for all those who chose that option, who got to minimize personal risk, but it's also a win for those who chose the equally worthy method of voting by going into the polling place because they faced less risk as well. There just weren't as many people there as normal. Um, we did a great job, I think, as a system in making sure we had supplies and PPE in the polling place. We did a great job of making sure we didn't have a shortage of election judges. That was something that crippled other states during the primary process. You know, all of us in our lives, to some extent, uh, are paid to or otherwise, even if we're not, we stay up thinking about all the bad things that could happen. That's what we're paid to do. That's what is expected of us. And that was one of the things on our dashboard that was a big blinking light. You look at what happened in Georgia and Wisconsin and other states during the primary season, horrific scenes of really long lines due in large part to chronic understaffing. If I can use the vernacular here, people who were freaked out about being election judges in polling places, especially at the dawn of COVID in March and April before we knew what we know now. And so we were determined not to have that happen and it didn't happen. We also blessedly saw a blissful absence of violence and conflict. We, we who were worried about this were not wrong. We were not paranoid. We were not delusional. We were right to worry about it, but blessedly that did not happen. There were precious few reports of even attempted uh, voter intimidation or conflict or violence. And when I say conflict, it's even over little things. Uh, there, there really were only isolated reports of conflicts or fights over masks, over political apparel, over uh, attempted or perceived uh, voter intimidation or obstruction. And that's a good thing, but that didn't happen by accident. That isn't dumb luck. That isn't a coincidence. That's because you and our office and many people were very, very vigilant. So just because it didn't happen doesn't mean it was overblown and that we shouldn't have been paying attention to it. We should have been, and we did. So in many ways, this is the story of the dog that didn't bark. It's the story of all the planes that land safely. We like to say in our office that, as you know, the, the news media for all the right reasons, and this is rational behavior, uh, they don't cover all the planes that land safely. They cover the crashes. And, and we understand why that is. There are a lot of planes that landed safely. Uh, and they're not going to get a lot of headlines. And that's, that's fine. That's rational that they don't. But I just want you to know that that was intentional. And that happened as a result of a lot of people's work up and down the system. Uh, you're wondering about turnout. I'm sure it looks tentatively. Fingers crossed. We're not going to crow about it until after Tuesday and the last vote in Minnesota and other states are in, but it looks like right now we are, again, number one in the country. Colorado was talking some real trash the last couple <laughs> of years. I know that they were number two and determined to beat us in 2018, so much so that Senator Klobuchar and Senator Bennett of Colorado had a high profile side bet. Uh, Senator Klobuchar has won that bet, apparently. The elections director of Colorado uh, texted our elections director to concede yesterday. Um, and so we think, now anything could happen, but not only are we number one in the country in voter turnout third time in a row, uh, 2016, 2018, and now this year, but we have smashed a modern day record. As of just before I got on, we're at 79.3%. Um, so we're knocking on the door of 80. I'm not sure if we're going to get there, but 79.3%. And to put that in perspective, the last time Minnesota uh, came near that was 1956. That's a 64 year high. For some reason, people were super excited about Eisenhower versus Stevenson. I'm not sure why. In 1956, for some reason, we were at 82 or 83% of the of vote. Um, and so we haven't been that high since then. So it's gonna climb a little bit as absentee uh, ballots trickle in over the coming days, but we're in really good shape. I do wanna say, and this is, uh, I'll end on this, not to be uh, pessimistic, but to be realistic and to um, uh, to, to say good things about the Minneapolis Foundation. Yes, we're number one in the country and we're grateful for that and we're proud of that. And it is worth celebrating, but let's please not forget as I know you don't because that's why you're so effective that just because we're number one in the country does not mean we have a lot of room to improve and to grow. 
Not every community in Minnesota, either demographically or geographically, votes at sky high levels. And we have to remember that. It's great to pat ourselves on the back, and we should. It's, it's not a binary choice. We should pat ourselves on the back, but also realize that in the coming weeks, months, and years, it's really incumbent on all of us to make sure that everyone is sharing that success and that high participation. Again, demographically and geographically throughout Minnesota, that's the work that you are so, so good at. That's the value that you added this cycle. And I'll just end by saying you own a chunk of this success. You at the Minneapolis Foundation, you RT Ryback in particular. RT took some of my phone calls and texts and emails. I really sought out his guidance and his counsel uh, on things uh, throughout this election cycle. He's someone who um, I will tell you, you're not surprised to hear this, but um, I think uh, when I think of RT, he's someone who uh, gets both the policy and the politics, and that's a rare blend. And so I relied on him with the errant late night text or phone call to see, hey, does this make sense to you? Or you think we're getting this right? Or are we tone deaf? And I'm gonna continue to debug him from time to time on that because I see him and through him, you, as people who really understand that. So I wanna thank you very much. You own a piece of the success, but we know that despite the success, there's a lot of room to grow, a lot of room to improve. And I and we together, I think are committed to that. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Thanks for those, those great words. Just, I know we have you for just two more minutes. Let me just That's ask fine. you one question. These, these forums, we really try to have to be not just a place where people can listen, but how they can act. And we're really encouraging people to use all of our impact levers, contributions, activism, and others. Can you give us just a couple issues uh, in just a couple minutes we have you that we should be watching in the next uh, next couple of years, certainly in the legislative session that, that we could uh, put our shoulder to, to make sure we're, we're protecting and growing our democracy? Absolutely. There are several legislative changes that I think are uh, ripe, even though it looks like we're probably headed for more divided government. We're probably headed to be, again, the only state in the country, the only one that has a divided legislative chamber, if you can believe that. Every other state is either House and Senate red, House and Senate blue. We are poised now to be the only one of 50 states where it's split. So that means we're gonna have to seek some consensus. And, uh, and one issue where I think there's consensus in particular is restoring the right to vote for those who have left prison behind. We have somewhere in the neighborhood of 60,000, maybe north of that, Minnesotans who are caught in this limbo. They have done their time, but they don't have the right to vote back yet. There is real promise for that piece of legislation because it does have deep bipartisan support. Uh, as of last year, not quite enough deep bipartisan support, but it's real. And some of you who have been around the legislature or Congress, you know how, uh, and everyone does it, somebody can call something bipartisan when there are 29 Democrats and one Republican, or 29 Republicans and one Democrat, and they claim it's nominally bipartisan. This is not that. You have uh, con many, several conservative Republicans, not just one or two, that are deeply committed to this issue, as well as progressive or, or liberal Democrats, um, it's still going to be an uphill climb. I don't want to. I don't want to fool you about that. But there's a growing consensus that that's something that we should do. Uh, redistricting for reform is another one. This is a time to strike while the iron is hot. Uh, make sure we have a process by which uh, you know voters continue to pick their elected leaders, not the other way around. And uh, that's something that could gain some traction as well. Uh, automatic voter registration is something that's caught on in red and blue states as a way not only to clean up the voter rolls, but to make the system even uh, more hassle-free, to take out even more friction out of the system, uh, even in a state like Minnesota, where we have same-day voter registration. So those are some examples. There are others as well of things we could do, and we can do even under divided government. Um, it's going to be a challenge. I'm not going to kid you. But those are some things uh, going forward that we should emphasize. The other thing I just have to say, RT, that is not legislative, and I know you get this, but it bears repeating, is um, just as uh, a lot of people say to elected leaders, you've heard this many times in your time in elected office, RT, like, well, we don't just want to hear about you in the last three months before an election. We don't want you to come around uh, during the last few months of election. Just as that is the case, I sometimes push back and say to some partners in some communities, okay, th that's great, and that's fair, and that's true, and that's right. But by the same token, don't just get excited about voter mobilization and engagement either in the last few months of the election. Let's have a discussion in the summer of 2021 about, or the spring of 2021 about how we can make things easier and better in 2022. Don't just come to us and seek partnership on making elections smoother and easier for a community in August of the election year. 
do that work early and do it in the calendar year before. And I know you get that as well, but I just had to say that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, we sure appreciate you on a day like this, especially. And I, I hope along with uh, the work you got ahead, you can take a victory lap at some point. Great work. So thank you very much. It's thank you all. You. Really appreciate your partnership and your passion. Good. Um, and, you know, by the way, that point that the secretary was just making about long term work, that's the work. And as Shonda talks more about Catherine's work later, it's really about this foundation's been at it for a long time. So we're going to stay in it. Well, let's dive in now to, thanks very much. We so appreciate you coming. Um, let's dive into a couple other things. One of the things, let's start with just that whole point about divided government. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that people will often choose divided government uh, intentionally. And um, one of the things I, I did in my election geeky kind of way is I went through every single legislative race, House and Senate, and kind of looked at the numbers and all of that. Did I see a lot of what we call ticket splitting? You know, somebody voting for Democrat here and a Republican here? Not much. Did I see much crossover with urban rural? Not much at all. In fact, it looks as if there's a difference between divided government where people are sending to government to represent them people from different parties. I've got a Democratic senator, I've got a Republican representative. That's not really what's happening here. It's that people are choosing both of their representatives, for instance, to the legislature from one party, and geographically, there is a massive, massive divide. One of the biggest dynamics over the past few years with the state, it's pretty well stated, is that there's been this huge shift in northern Minnesota and rural Minnesota, parts that used to have much more of a Democratic base. That has now become much more of a Republican base. And most notably, the suburbs especially the South and Western ones of, uh, of Minneapolis, St. Paul, have um, dramatically shifted to Democrats. One of the races that um, was most interesting to watch actually happened to involve a board member of Minneapolis Foundation, Gretchen Piper, who was running in the far Western suburbs. The House side of her, her Senate race was Kelly Morrison, a Democrat who won that for the first time in many, many years. The other side was a Republican. Uh, Gretchen Piper was running as a Democrat. She lost that race. Um, and that's sort of the, the line that you can see about where Democrats and Republicans split in the Senate. It's directly down that, that Senate race as you go west where the Minotristas and others, that's, that's a, one of those things that when you cross that line, there's a big ideological and probably cultural line as well. So, we have to be especially uh, mindful of what that urban rural uh, divide is gonna be. We also have to recognize that this is a very special election because it's what's going to set the pace for redistricting. As you look at not only legislatures in Minnesota and other states around the country, but also at the congressional races, all of those were set on the census data that was put into the redistricting um, uh, for the 2012 race. So in other words, 2012 happened, these legislatures redistricted after that. That also happened to be the Tea Party race. It was the one where there was a huge backlash against Obamacare. It meant that there was a huge shift uh, across the country, Republicans controlling legislatures. And so the seats in Congress were drawn based on that. Now the seats in Congress will be drawn partly on what happened in this race. And it's interesting to mention that because you also have to recognize this election, unlike the one I just mentioned, was in pretty much any assessment, not an ideological one. Remember that race in 2012 for the House where everybody was talking about Obamacare? We heard protect your health care, but we sure didn't hear many people talking about getting rid of health care over a decade has gone from being the single most motivating issue for certainly one party and, and others into one that is a given. And in fact, near the end, lots of people who'd spent a decade trying to kill Obamacare were talking about how they're gonna protect your pre-existing conditions in your healthcare. So one of the things that has happened with after a whole lot of drama is that healthcare is no longer as deeply controversial an issue. So what we should be watching is, what does it mean if say Biden wins and it's a democratic president who's talked about immediately expanding that to have a public option in healthcare versus having probably a Republican Senate and a Democrat in uh, are running the House. So that will be a really interesting uh, issue to be following. 
Um, coming back into this area, one of the things that we've heard very little um, comment about, but it matters an enormous amount to this region and to our work, is what's happening with Hennepin County. Hennepin County has one out of every four residents of the state. It also has a massive tax base. If you really look at where the tax revenue comes from in the state, Hennepin County is absolutely unquestionably the engine. And the county board over these past couple elections has shifted dramatically. Um, there have been some people who've been on that board for a long time, uh, Commissioner Peter McLaughlin, Mike Opat, uh, Jeff Johnson, uh, all uh, stepping down, people like Irene Fernando, Angela Conley coming onto that. Now a couple more uh, of those sh seats have shifted, most notably Jeff Johnson, who uh, was definitely the most conservative member of the county board. He ran for governor as well, you may remember. Um, his seat now is being occupied by a Democrat. The county board has shifted. And if you think about that tax base, if you think about the period we're in right now with the implications for public health, for uh, job creation, Hennepin County may be the government to watch over the next, uh, next couple of years. It is not a split government. It's one where there's fairly uniform visions about where to go. It's now being led on, on the uh, elected side by people who are relatively new to politics, much more similarity than that county board has ever had. Another election that is quite interesting is the school board race in Minneapolis, which got very little notoriety. It came after a controversial uh, redesign of city schools. And the chair of the school board, Kim Ellison, was running citywide for re-election. That there was a candidate running against her who was very uh, strongly, uh, or I shouldn't say against, but was certainly questioning the, um, the new uh, redesign for the schools. Had that candidate won versus the chair, Kim Ellison, that might have been a real uh, blow to the sitting superintendent. However, the school board coming in now could be seen as generally very supportive of the redesign for the, uh, that the superintendent went through. This matters a lot to our work at the Minneapolis Foundation. We didn't pick sides, we don't pick sides in election. But one of the things we're trying to do is to say that we want the school district to move in a direction. Well, now they have the direction, they put it in place. We're actually working on a on uh, more partnership on that, uh, that'll be going forward. And as Sean knows her team work on that, they'll have a school board that is probably more unified in ideology than, than they've, uh, they've been before. One of the things that's also to keep an eye on are the city races, um, not just about the fact that we're starting an election right now, but uh, which will, their election comes up in a year. And so I imagine every single person coming up every other campaign is being gobbled up by people running for mayor and council in Minneapolis. But they're gonna be looking out for redistricting themselves. And this is something that is way in the weeds and we don't normally pay attention to, but it's gonna have a lot of resonance. There are two really dramatic shifts going on in the city. One pushing the city in a superficial way, you can say moving it much more to the left and the other moving it more toward the center. Nobody's to the right in Minneapolis, but, um, that dynamic is going to be very interesting because when redistricting happens, there are right now some districts that are the most progressive that also happen to have the fewest number of residents in them. The 13th Ward in Southwest Minneapolis has, I think, about eight or 9,000 more people in it than the 5th Ward in North Minneapolis. When you look at redistricting and you're trying to have that even, there's gonna be a big change in that. And that could change the dynamic of some of the council races. I'll give an example. Um, North and Northeast Minneapolis have not always worked together. There have also historically been some deep racial divides on that. The ward uh, that was drawn that council member Don Samuels ran in, a person, an African-American from North Minneapolis had to appeal also to the constituency on the other side of the river. When redistricting happened, Don got redistricted in with Natalie Johnson Lee in North Minneapolis and, and the dynamic, including the racial dynamic of that change. These kinds of changes are very much in the weeds, but we should be paying attention on the next couple of years as they go forward. Without going any further on that, I wanna turn it over to Shonda and she and I can talk about this more, but 
Sean, I'm going to pass the baton to you now to talk a bit about what does this all mean for uh, for where we're going. <laughs> well, you know, RT, thanks for um, providing the overview. I think that um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, great points that have been raised. I think I want to go to where. Um, Secretary Simon went first and I was sharing with um, you and others yesterday, just this idea of um, the predictability of our election no longer feels predictable. <laughs> um, you know, it, it feels like we are all kind of um, decentered or being rocked by what's happening. Um, it's being layered in with the pandemic and layered in with the racial um, uh, dynamics that are happening. And I think that what we see in the national election is that um, and you, you can speak to this better than I can, but the blocks of voters versus the black community feels this way or the Latino community feels this way. It's not a monolith. And I think that it's incredibly important for us to understand the nuances that exist within communities so that we can continue to be effective in terms of engaging, um, not just in democracy, not just in the work that Catherine is leading, but in moving issues forward. And so, you know, one example of this, and um, this has been very consistent, and I think towards the end um, of, of this election cycle, um, there was lots of stuff, if you were watching either our uh, football players, our rappers, like African-American men that were coming out and, and being very pointed about um, not feeling like either option was a great option. And so, you know, even I thought that was a little bit of, you know, whatever, whatever they're over there talking. Um, but even in, in my own sort of circle, um, having conversations with younger African-American men saying, I don't think either are an option, right? Either option is still gonna lead us um, to a place that is not good for us as young black men. And I think that it's important for us to understand the impact of um, policing and George Floyd, um, the aftermath of that, the rising concerns of institutions and systems aren't for us, they've never been for us. And so they're not buying into it in the way that perhaps um, folks that have either been working in the system like I have or around it or have more experience or have had unnecessary patience, right? Maybe their impatience is, is exactly what we need to move us forward. And so, you know, Catherine um, is here if you all have questions to respond, to, um, to, to ask questions about our specific work. But when I'm looking at um, not just the issues and when you layer in sort of the context and all of these things that you're mentioning, redistricting, um, it feels like leadership at the local level is moving very quickly. It's churning very quickly and it's changing very quickly, which um, we have a lot of uh, younger electeds that are coming in, people that haven't had the depth, um, they haven't had the relationship perhaps even with the parties. Um, so what does that mean in terms of our understanding and frankly, our comfort level, not just as an institution that's working in partnership, but as residents of the city. Um, when I think about our work specifically, um, you know, to those uh, listening, if you have not seen our new strategic framework, I invite you to go look at it. Um, it, it is a document that I'm incredibly um, inspired by and um, uh, pleased with because it doesn't just address the what we do, it addresses how we do that work. It re-cements our focus on addressing uh, systems change. It, it uh, focuses on our relationship with communities, um, our, our need to amplify the voices that exist within the community, which means that our voice is in support of that, that we, we provide a leadership role in terms of convening and providing perspective but that our, our role, I think, is um, bringing people together and finding places that we can move forward, identifying gaps in our community, opportunities um, for us to move forward and gaps where things are not working. And this team has been um, very deliberately mapping that out and moving forward. So a couple of things, the three things that I think that we um, will be continuing to wrestle with in our community um, and I invite, again, use the chat because I'm watching it too, because um, we want to hear from you and what you think those top issues are. But, you know, so policing, I think, you know, police reform is going to continue to be right at the, at the top of the work that we need to do. I think not just in Minnesota, but on a national level, how are we going to reimagine public safety? Um, I'm so glad that we've been in that work for the last um, three years or so, and we are going to go even deeper into that work because we think it's incredibly important for us not just to focus on 
what do we need to do with the police department, but what do we need to do to have public safety in a way that supports our community, that brings us confidence, that has us responding to the needs. Um, there are clearly some infrastructure concerns that um, I think are embedded in the defund movement, whether you agree with that language or not. There has been inadequate support for um, our, our neighbors that are struggling with mental health and chemical uh, dependency issues and um, in and, and homelessness. And so policing and jail and prisons are not the response to that. And uh, we need to think more deeply about that. The pandemic, um, you know, we're still in a pandemic. Um, our secretary, uh, Simon, talked about how it, it um, impacted our election season, but it's impacting everything, our schools, all of the work that we sit in, our economic uh, recovery, um, our economic progress here in the city. So we're doubling down on those issues um, and making sure that uh, folks um, uh, have that, it, that uh, information and, and we bring a point of view. And then lastly, I think, um, you know, going to the convening role that we have is um, the polarization. Um, it's, it's really clear, um, with the nuances that I've explained, right? It's not, a, communities aren't a monolith. Um, there are lots of differences of opinion, but we are pretty split as a country. And uh, we have moved so deeply into what uh, many call a cancel culture. If I don't agree with you, I'm canceling you. If, I, if we disagree on one issue, I, I'm done. I can't be at the table. Um, we have to find a way to move past that, or I'm afraid we're not gonna be able um, to move forward as a community. And so we are going to continue to provide opportunities, um, even in a podcast, right? Like there are so many conversations that I have um, where I'm like, oh, you know, I don't know how I personally feel, but I have to recognize that there are people that feel the way that the guest does. And I think it's important that we provide um, an opportunity for voices that are dissenting from our own um, in, in, a, in a way that allows us to be at the table because um, that, but by getting more proximate to issues, to communities, to people, um, I think we do better. So I'll pause there, our TNC, um, if you have anything to ask or to uh, add. Yeah, I wanna actually do um, just a call to action if I can. One of the things, as I mentioned, we really try to do in these events is to give you something to do. After all of this kind of stuff, it sounds strange for me to ask you to do something kind of wonky, but it's really important. I want you to read a House bill. It's HR 1. It is the first bill that was passed um, when the new Congress uh, convened when Nancy Pelosi became the Speaker. Uh, and one of the leaders of that is actually Dean Phillips, from, uh, who just got reelected from here. It's a bipartisan effort, but Democrats have been uh, especially supporting that. What it does is it takes a series of things together, different reforms about electoral college, about redistricting, about um, campaign finance reform. That be I mentioned it, the Democrats supported it because almost certainly they will introduce that probably as the second bill right after COVID reform. So that's gonna be introduced. How will the Senate act? The Senate may still be in Republican hands with a Democratic president and a Democratic um, uh, House how will they act? Now, one of the things that's important about that is there's one part of that, which is redistricting. We have split government, so we may have bipartisan redistricting. What that means is very different than what nonpartisan redistricting is. I don't believe in any partisanism in districting. Bipartisan redistricting, which we could have, is the House people say, we'll protect our seats, and the senators say, we'll protect the Republican seats and they're gerrymandered on both sides. I don't think politicians should decide who gets to put them in, in their position. What we need to do is to, to have a more bipartisan commission that independently looks at that. So one of the things we should be looking at is look at that house file, look at the issues of redistricting as well. And let's also recognize that as good as we should feel about turnout, we should feel absolutely, completely, totally outraged by the voter suppression we have seen in this. And I say should, and it's tough to ever in a position like we sit in use the word should. I don't understand how anyone in this country cannot be outraged by seeing 10 hour lines that are disproportionately in places where there are people of color. 
And the fact of the matter is, this goes back to a Supreme Court decision that said that states with uh, histories of voter suppression couldn't make big changes in their, um, in their voter laws unless they've got it pre-approved. Now they do it and you have to prove that it was wrong. The net effect of that is, among other things, closing 15,000 voting places, primarily where people of color locate. That's a huge problem. So I really want to encourage people to dig into that and we will be looking at that as well. Um, I don't easily throw, go ahead. Shonda. I'm gonna throw you a couple of questions and yeah. um, based on the redistricting piece, I think Georgia is a state to watch. Stacey Abrams was incredible in terms of lifting that issue. Um, the, there's a question here that says, how do I find HR1? Do you have some guidance or Catherine, can you put the bill yeah. in the chat? Yes, we'll, um, we'll, we'll put that in the chat and we'll, we'll send some, some things out with you, but everybody will get a copy of that uh, in the email that we send out to you. And, perfect. Um, okay. added it. Dan, Dan has a question. Will the newly elected legislature do the redistricting or will the 2022 legislature? Either way, how can we leverage our influence to make this a process 2022 legislature reasonable? We actually, I think, should have a conversation about whether the foundation can play a role. I, I strongly believe that we should, so we'll be following you back up with that. It's based on the census data that we had now. Catherine, double check me on this, on how, uh, on, on the answer on that redistricting then. So it's not, um, I, the, the foundation can play a role in redistricting and if so, Catherine, how so? Do you, well, I'm sorry, I don't know the nuance and whether it's this, this, I'm blanking on what the answer is to that. So I'm gonna to have to skip over that, but we'll get you the answer to that one, uh, that one as well. And whether it's, it's based on this census, but um, I know that in the city, the city race, for instance, what happens is that the city council will get uh, redistricted and run again in the 2013 uh, races. Yeah, we can't hear you, Catherine. So I'm gonna, uh, we will follow up uh, with that question. I apologize that we weren't more cohesive there, but Brett has a question around policing. Is there a split in the black community on the north side and the south side, or is that an illusion? How does one understand what is going on there? So Brett, there is a split in the black community on the north side with the north side um, and, and likely with the south side because it's just not a monolith. Um, uh, what I would say to you is that, um, you know, I'm sitting uh, with you right now from the north side of Minneapolis, and uh, there are um, my neighbors and others that are not in favor necessarily of the defund movement um, and have uh, lots of concerns. Um, as you know, you have uh, a lawsuit now, Don and Sandra Samuels are part of, Kathy Spann. Um, and two others that are looking and, and suing the, the city for um, a lack of police response uh, related to um, the violence and operating outside of the city charter. Um, and so I think that it is a quite a dynamic um, situation that is occurring. I think that what we're missing right now is vision casting on what does public safety look like and what is our route there. We are squarely in that conversation, um, recognizing that we probably need to be more visible than we have been, but we are definitely involved. Um, I think that there are uh, both the policing and how do we um, address policing? And then I think the convergence of um, what's happening politically and what's happening in terms of increased violence and community are all coming together in a very interesting way. Um, so, um, you know, how we're choosing to understand the issue, Brett, is by being in conversations with all of the sides and figuring out where are the places that we can convene, where are the places that we think we can find progress and really operating squarely um, in the complexity. Um, I don't know if it's time to simplify. We totally understand that there's a time uh, to act on this. And so I'm happy to follow up with, with anyone uh, related to our work um, off off offline off here. 
The next question uh, from Jim uh, Anderson was such a high a voter turnout and the use of absentee bullet voting. Why is voter suppression viewed as an issue? It doesn't seem that Minnesota has issues providing access to voting. What am I missing? Um, I'm gonna jump there and then RT, you can, and um, you're muted too. Um, but when, um, what I would say, uh, Jim, is that, you know, in, in the community in part, and specifically in communities that have been denied their right to vote over many generations, the way that you get involved in politics are not the same um, because those, by, those, those votes, particularly in the South, were not accessible to you in the same way. With social media and the connection of our community, what happens when there's voter suppression and people see long lines on the news is that they can make an assumption that those long lines will happen in our city. And so it's as much about the narrative and the possibility. And if you're unfamiliar and not comfortable with going uh, to vote and you see intimidation that's happening or you see that something is going on, it gets into your own psyche and triggers that that's not a place for me. And so I think voter suppression anywhere has an impact on our um, voter outcomes in Minnesota for those communities that have been most traumatized um, by the election and the democratic process. I have to say that, you know, as a white person who's been involved in elections since I was a child, I didn't really get voter suppression deeply enough until I began door knocking. And in my career, I wound up door knocking every single public housing uh, building uh, multiple times uh, extensively in North Minneapolis, multiple other places over and over and over again. And I can't tell you how many times what Shonda just said right there was reflected back to me in ways that were shocking to me because I, you know, was used to walking down to the polling place with, you know, as a kid with my mom and as an adult, and I never saw it. And it shocked me when I saw it. It shocked me more when I was vice chair of the uh, DNC and I was sent around the country. And I, I go all over the South and certainly see that there. But I saw huge voter suppression in Ohio where they cut off the Sunday voting, which meant they cut off souls to the polls. And I felt, um, well, it's just not for my part of the country. And then they sent me to Wisconsin, which had the worst voter suppression I've seen ever, not just for people of color, but for young people. And then I felt really great about, well, I live in Minnesota and on election night, I was sent out to Brooklyn Center where the Brooklyn Park, I'm sorry, where there were a bunch of immigrants who were in a multi-hour line and, um, you know, and then went over to the university where there are huge lines. We don't have enough polling places for starters and election day, I believe is a, um, is a really bad idea that has huge unintentional bias in there, if nothing else, against people who are working. Probably the best single election reform that has come out of this election is that in the last few months before our eyes, election day as an entity, I think, has fallen. I think it's over. I don't think we're going to have election day anymore. We have three ways to vote in this election. I think we're going to get those expanded. And that is a really good thing because different people in different circumstances can vote. And I think the proof is in the pudding. But still, if you think that if your ballot that's being mailed is going to be uh, slowed at the post office by what seems to be an intentional effort, if you feel, if you hear someone like the president talking about sending, having people be armed at polling places, that's suppression. And that's an outrage and we got to act against it. I think that, you know, I think that the, the piece here that I think is important to understand because I think the the emotion um, behind race and systemic issues is not always um, played out, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist because of other experiences. And so um, I think this is a really interesting thing for us to continue to dive into. Um, I had uh, my young neighbors coming to my door, Miss Shonda, will you take me to the polling place? My ID doesn't match this and I'm scared they're gonna send me away and I'm gonna be embarrassed. Absolutely, I will go with you. And those that is coming from both not having um, experience, but it's also coming from stories that come forward within families of being turned away and denied. Um, we have a question here about will the foundation be involved with the truth and reconciliation efforts at the city? 
Uh, we're certainly aware of them. We have um, some donors um, and we've been in conversations around that. Um, and uh, that is something that we are in a deep consideration on what is our role and what is the opportunity for the Minneapolis Foundation. So Brett, if you have an opinion about that, please follow up with me um, so that I can understand if, if that's a, you want us to be or you don't want us to be a uh, uh, response there. Catherine has also um, added into uh, the chat the answer to the earlier question um, around redistricting. Can I just touch on that, that um, truth and reconciliation point? Because John and I have been in a couple of conversations. People have come to us with all sorts of different issues. And this obviously is really important as we're looking at the policing issues. It's, it's just a very, very important conversation for us to be engaged in because so many people ask these basic questions. Why can't we, all, why can't we get along? Why can't we put these things in the past? The issue of acknowledging past injustice is a huge issue. And I think that is one that is really hard for white people to come to and to recognize that, that acknowledging what has been wrong in the past is part of a path to healing, but it's a necessary step. And um, just know that we're thinking very hard about what, what we can, can do on that. In the, um, Catherine, I'm wondering if your, um, your sound quality has improved and, and if you can just touch on perhaps some of the work that you've been doing that might be um, maybe just a few minutes on just what you focused on. Well, we've been focusing, well, first of all, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we've been focusing this, the last eight, nine years around um, community organizing year round, pretty much like, uh, like uh, Secretary Simon talked about, which was um, engaging communities around issues they care about, including voting, um, year round and doing community organizing with organ with with populations in the in the state of Minnesota, predominantly the Twin Cities region, but actually uh, the whole state. That typically the number one are very impacted by policies that aren't you know working well for them, and also are, are less engaged or less li less likely to feel that they have the power to weigh in on them. And so I think that's part of one of the things that that Secretary Simon was us on the back a bit about was that the efforts that we've made to um, invest in organizations that are investing year round in uh, engagement uh, around issues that people care about, whether it's policing, whether it's uh, economic um, options and job training programs and, and funding from the legislature, uh, or whether it's issues of democracy and that kind of thing. So We've been, we've been, we're really proud of that body of work. And I think we do, we've definitely seen a um, steady growth and increase in participation among our targeted uh, areas of the city of Minneapolis, as well as the targeted populations in terms of their participation um, in elections and in some of the showing up to weigh in or at the legislature around things that they care about. One of the things I wanted to touch on uh, briefly is Shonda raised this, this point earlier about, um, about young people, especially looking at this moment of time. She and I have had a couple of good conversations and talked about um, a, a conversation she had with, with younger people who felt, especially with some of these policing issues that the issues weren't really being addressed. That's obviously an extremely deep issue as you cross racial lines. It's also one that's about age. And I'm really worried right now about the, um, the disappointment and the lack of uh, addressing issues for young voters. Um, we spent, we just had an election with two people. You can pick who you wanted for president. Both of them were very old uh, compared to the rest of the population. We didn't hear pretty much anything being talked about about college debt. We didn't hear uh, a very deep discussion about some of these deep issues of race and policing that we have talked about. We heard precious little about climate. Um, these shouldn't be ideological issues, but they are very much generational issues. 
And they're ones that I feel we are on the brink of losing a generation believing in their democracy. And I don't understate that. That's a huge issue. And I think if we all think about conversations in our own families, um, I've seen what it means when people, uh, young people are deeply electrified by candidates. And I've seen what happens when it doesn't. And more important, I've seen what happens 10 years later. Our farm team is calling out to us and saying, you've got to make changes in this democracy and you've got to, in the way we vote in who's allowed to vote and how we redistribute that and more important in the issues we're addressing. And uh, I think we should take a very, very sober look at this election. There's a lot that can be pointed to as real success and all of that. But I worry more, more than anything about the generational gap that's going on here. And uh, I find that to be probably the most sobering part of waking up today and seeing where we're at. Yeah, I think the other thing about voter suppression as I'm really thinking about it, and, and again, um, Secretary Simon mentioned it, I think Catherine mentioned it briefly, but the restore the vote and having 60,000 um, people within Minnesota that have um, exited our criminal justice system that are not allowed to participate um, in our elections. That, that is a significant issue um, for us. I hopefully um, we will continue to work on that. We believe that the vote should be restored. I did a podcast yesterday with someone who um, just recently got their vote. Uh, restored and uh, the energy I could feel through the screen of just the pride. Um, but it followed up with a question of, you know, I voted for the first time and it was someone that was, you know, 30s, 40 years old. Why, why would that be? And what would have happened when you were younger that would have made that different? And what could we do differently? And the response was, you have to make it relevant to an experience. If you are living in poverty, and you can't figure out how you're gonna make your ends meet. We have to be able to cast a vision that allows for people at all those stages um, and places to see themselves in progress. And so I thought it was a very interesting um, sort of uh, perspective that makes complete sense to me. Um, and I do think that not just age, but I think class is gonna, um, gonna be a, a continued uh, issue for us to think about is how we bridge, bridge that. Um, we got two more questions, RT. Do we have time for them? Yeah, we can do them quick. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Paul Jackson, uh, can the foundation influence the adoption of real police reform and restore a sense of safety in our community? You want me to take that? You got it. You that. take it. Yeah, go. Um, I think that we have a role, right? I don't think that uh, any one uh, group, I don't think the city council can do it alone, the mayor, the chief. Uh, the police officers of the foundation, I think it's going to be a collective issue. Um, I know that it is a completely divisive issue that is going to require us to be at the table together. Um, what I completely believe in is that we all have um, a very similar sort of vision of what it could be like. We have different routes to get there. What I will say, uh, Paul, and to uh, you all listening is that um, I am very, very involved on the national scene and in conversations with the Policing Project at NYU, um, with other things that are, uh, other groups that are, are operating locally and nationally. And uh, our team and I just this morning, we're talking about mapping out and forecasting some of the work that's coming ahead. Uh, we know for certain that we will be um, providing some uh, convenings and opportunities for um, our community connected to the Minneapolis Foundation and beyond um, to be engaged with listening to hearing how um, other states are looking at this. Um, I think we have a significant role um, and we, we plan to, to lead into that more boldly than what we have done um, in, in recent months. And yes, Lisa, I will continue to do uh, the podcast. Thank you for that shout out. And um, we've got some really good ones coming up. Uh, Sharon Sells Belton, our former mayor, um, I talked with her about police reform and other things that will be out this Friday. And then um, Mike Vick is actually who I talked to yesterday and, you know, controversial uh, for some, uh, but definitely someone who has uh, served his time. And my question was very much about what does redemption look like? How do you move forward? How do you um, create change? Um, and what can he share uh, that we need to understand? And so looking forward to both of those. 
You know, just, just to wrap this up, um, I want us to think about that last point that um, was it Paul Jackson uh, asked, uh, asked Shonda uh, about on what role we can play. This city is in desperate need of a big conversation about what keeps us safe and how we can act together to keep safe. And that's about a whole lot of things around policing and many, many other things. So when do you have a conversation and what's the role of the foundation? Well, one of the ways you have a conversation around big issues is actually something called an election. Now, I just mentioned we didn't really have a national conversation this time. We, we had a whole lot of issues about people and personalities and styles and everything else. This was not an issue-based conversation. The city of Minneapolis now is about to begin an election and that will influence not only the city, but how this whole region looks at safety. When I first ran for mayor, there was a very active effort to bring affordable housing into that discussion. Because of that, I had to go to forums, I had to go to others, Mayor Sales Belton and I who were in that election and others had to really know our stuff on affordable housing because there was all of this public pressure. It wasn't just what issues we wanted. The public was pushing us, not just one idea, but bring us all your ideas. So now let's look at the foundation. One of the things we can be doing in this election, this is what Sean and I were talking about, is how do we really help make sure that that conversation is a good one, it's a smart one, it's an elevated one, and that we're creating space for that conversation to take place. Not to decide what the community does, but how the community's collective vision moves forward. That's what an election in its purest sense is about. So we're about to do that. And uh, we're thinking hard about how we can play a role in that, but you should be, each of you, thinking really hard about that too, because this shouldn't be about candidates saying yes or no. Active citizens pushing issues, listening, learning, and then advocating is part of what you should do. And that's what we're very much gonna focus on as well. Sean, any final words? I just, you know, I, I am embracing the complexity of the moment. <laughs> I, I want to just really, I mean, I just am. There's no other way but to live into it and to lead into it. And so, um, again, you know, I'm celebrating uh, right now. I'm finding moments to celebrate. And so I'm celebrating um, a really successful election season for our state. I'm celebrating um, the, the framework that we just put out, which is incredible. Our value statements are something that um, I can completely live into. Um, and I'm excited about it. Uh, our work is, is um, continuing to evolve in relationship with others. And, um, you know, I hope that uh, everyone listening today continues to engage with the Minneapolis Foundation, our work, um, to partner with us where it makes sense and to push us where you think we could be doing better. So that's what I have. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.